Hello, how are you? I'm really good. It's good to see you again. Me yeah, too. I'm excited to see uh, how you interpret my results for me. <laughs> Absolutely. It's going to be fun to look at them. We've got three in a row that we yeah. can kind of look at historical, yeah. which I think is a really fun way of being able to just quickly kind of assess how someone's doing. And hopefully this correlates with, you know, how you're feeling and yep i'm gonna be right. adding adding little tidbits as i go along do you want to introduce yeah. yourself to my doctors yeah hi i'm allison McAllister. i'm a naturopathic physician and i'm the head uh, physician here at zrt laboratory so i've been here at zrt for over 20 years teaching doctors every day how to interpret lab results and what do you do with them and implement them into your practice so that you get good results um, for your patients which is really the key right it is indeed. And the results we're people. doing today, they are my results. Uh, yeah. I've got quite an extensive history. <laughs> um, That's very just, generous of you to share. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when I first saw my 2023 results, the first thought I had was, oh my goodness, this is, these are going to be great teaching results. Because mm. what I did at the time, um, I, I came with all my supplements uh, for a couple of weeks before. But I also moved house, which um, unfortunately I got exposed to dust, which had mold spores in it. So I was moldy. Mm -hmm. I changed jobs. <laughs> I basically ticked all the stress boxes except divorce. Um, so, so I was extremely, <laughs> extremely stressed. And I was also just coming out of a, a year long stressful job. Um, yeah. So I decided to look at myself as the worst case scenario. Um, yeah. I wasn't feeling great. Um, as you can tell by the symptoms that I had, uh, I was I had digestive symptoms. I was mm -hmm. in pain all the time. I had allergies. I just like I was, I had anxiety like that was like electric. It was it was just yeah. all horrible. And and I knew where it was coming from. But if I was a patient who didn't know where it was coming from, I probably would have been rushing myself off to hospital because it felt terrible. Mm -hmm. It felt that bad. And yeah. Then, and then I got back onto all my supplements. Um, so this that was done in October. But mm -hmm. then a whole bunch of terrible things happened in my life uh, in huh. December and January. And it, it basically stopped me from progressing the way I would normally have progressed. So mm -hmm. I want the doctors looking at these results to understand the fact that I was only really able to implement life changes to affect the results about a month before I did my follow up. Up until that time, I was just holding on trying to survive. So mm -hmm. the results might reflect that. but. Mm -hmm. I decided to retest because I was feeling so much better. Finally, mm -hmm. feeling like I had a grip on my anxiety. Um, I wasn't, I was sleeping better. So yeah. I, I was had insomnia, so I was sleeping better. I wasn't in chronic pain anymore. My bowel movements were more regular and more normal. Um, so a lot of the symptoms that I had uh, had dissipated. But mm -hmm. Specifically, the stress response that I was—I was, I had like a really exaggerated stress response. Like I was—I would feel, yeah. I would make mountains out of molehills with that stress response. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I was struggling with it. I was on um, a cortisol regulating supplement that was not doing as good a job as the one I then changed to. Um, uh -huh. And that—that that was a turning point for me. Uh, I changed products, and boom! Suddenly, I was feeling better. But yeah, I was really happy, even though they're not perfect mm -hmm. results. I was mm -hmm. really happy to see that my my symptoms that I listed, um, obviously those are subjective, yeah. had, had all improved dramatically. So yeah, it's nice to be able to like look at this. This is the but the page uh, on the report where patients fill in their symptoms, just for people who are new to doing ZRT. So all of these are sort of a bubble of a zero, one, two, three people do it. And what's nice is that, you know, they don't see how they responded before. They just do another snapshot. And um, it is fun to see how they can change and how you can just quickly look at this and be like, oh, yeah, it's going to be a better appointment today when we talk about this person. This person feels better Absolutely. and you definitely feel better than you did i mean you still have certain things that you're very consistent on actually yeah. um you know and some of those are hormonal symptoms some of those are maybe not hormonal symptoms right i mean right off the bat the first one's aches and pains there's a lot of reasons for those not yeah. all hormonal but um yeah it's it was good to see how um how much better you really felt and really I have to say, like these levels are not that far from 
from being all in the green again. Yeah. Um, I'm looking forward to actually doing another test in about yeah. a month or two and, yeah. and all green. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, and having like, you know, mold exposure is so inflammatory. And I know you had a lot of other stressors too, but like, you know, mold is, it's an immunological response, but it is just so inflammatory. And um, it, it takes, it takes people a while to recover from that. And I'm glad you did it actually as quickly as you did. Yeah, I think, I mean, mold in this country, in the UK, is, uh, it, it's a consistent variable. I, I, it is here today. I, have to, I have to be aware of and manage on a day-to-day -day basis. So I have mm -hmm. air fires everywhere. I haven't come across an area in the UK that isn't moldy. And especially mm -hmm. with the changes in, in temperature, it's warmer now than it used to be. It's certainly yes. more humid. The yeah. humidity today was 78% and I had two dehumidifiers mm -hmm. on. So yeah, mold is... Mold is a constant battle, um, but at least I don't have the pains anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so. we have a very similar climate and also deal with mold. And also we, I, maybe even more than the UK, we go between like in Oregon anyways, we go between like nine months of, of rain all the time and then like three or four months of drought. And so, yeah, mold really loves Oregon and build it, you know, different building uh, requirements and building uh, things are sort of setting us up for mold issues, but it's super inflammatory. I mean, I think that's what people don't appreciate. And it definitely like it, you do see it hit the hormones, um, which is interesting because um, estrogen goes up when your inflammation goes up because um, estrogen's trying to fix things. I mean, that's the great thing with estrogen. It's an anti-inflammatory. Exactly. So, yeah. So, but yeah, I love to see how much, um, how much better your levels were here and well, how I'm, I'm excited to share them with people. I'm, yeah. Yeah. Well, your working, but are so much better. Yeah. I'm really, I'm really happy with the progress and I'm, I'm pleased with this test showing me in different ways, my progress. And I really, yeah. love the way, I love the way the reports are, you know, easy to read, actually, very yeah. easy to read. So, well, I mean, you know, when we talk to doctors, and I'm, I'm in, I'm in the trenches too. I see patients. You know, you get a lab result. You have five minutes, oftentimes, before you go in to see a patient, to be able to one get an assessment of how this appointment's going to do go, and two, like, really get the down low on it. You don't, you know, you don't always have like half an hour, 45 minutes or so to like really get into the report, you know, have to look stuff up online, like do all that deep research. Like you kind of need to be able to get a really quick grasp quickly, you know? And this test is, I think, one of the harder ones that ZRT has in doing that just because it there is a learning curve up front. You have to go into the physiology and sort of understand. But, you know, we try to make it as easy as possible for people. And um, I, I love the symptoms just because at least when you go in, you know, okay, this person's feeling better. Like we are on the right, the right track, um, you know, which is kind of a nice thing to be able to well, walk into we meant no, it's not getting worse. <laughs> let's let's head on up to the top and all right. Let's do everybody. It. Let's do a reveal. <laughs> yeah, let's do it here. My, all right. I'm gonna kind of scroll up here and we're gonna see where things are. I'm gonna bring you up here to this level. All right, so here you are. There's even more. No, 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 no. So I was like, that wasn't <laughs> at the top. Try to like just leave it right there for you. There we go. So this is it looks like so much numbers, but this is a history report. So we have all three. So you can see the one that's in the, the main colorful sliders right now, that's your current one. And then the middle one is your October result. And then we have one from like four years ago for you, which is actually really kind of interesting to have that one. I don't know how you were. I know you felt pretty good in January, um, yeah. but it's interesting to see a lot of your results become more like your January <laughs> results here versus what they were in, in October. Yeah. October yeah. Was, was, was pretty rough. I mean, yeah. 2020 was quite a good year health wise. I think yeah. I my best results. I was feeling pretty good. I mean, there are still quite a few highs and lows in that column that I can see. Yeah, there are. But yeah. things are better. But, you know, if we just go through these, I mean, and then everyone can kind of see the range to the right 
for you too. So you can kind of see the range and all of these are looking at the same range. So, you know, that's also handy too. Cause at some point, you know, people will go from, if they do this in the premenopausal years and then they go to postmenopausal, their ranges will be different. But for, for the nice thing is for you, we're looking at all the same ranges. Yeah. So, you know, um, should we just walk through it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And just to so, let people know, um, in, I was, it's a four year age gap and I've, I'm definitely going into perimenopause. Uh, I'm, I'm at that age. Yeah. <laughs> I'm 48 and a half at the moment. Oh. Um, so yeah, I, I do, I have noticed that there, there has been more of an estrogen dominance over the past year or so. Mm -hmm. That wasn't that wasn't there in in uh, 2020. So yeah. bearing that in mind as well, when we're looking at these results, is is my age has changed. <laughs> well, and that's really normal, right? Like we don't ovulate as strongly, and you know we see with some of our other tests, like our menstrual cycle mapping, just a very visual thing of what progesterone does as women hit mm -hmm. perimenopausal. You know, progesterone just you know, you still are ovulating, but it does start dropping. It doesn't get to these huge levels that we do see in, say, someone who's like 30 who has really regular periods all the time. You know, after 35, that progesterone level is relatively lower compared to estrogen. And sometimes it will, you know, it's still showing a little blip, but it's, you know, it's not very much of one. So, yeah. So, you know, when we look at these, we'll just kind of take them kind of chunk by chunk because I think that's the easiest way to assess these. Um, and the nice thing that I see, if we look at the top three, which we um, refer to, a, Dr. Zava likes to refer to as like the parent estrogens here. Um, what's nice is actually to see less of them. <laughs> and, and the reason that's nice is because these levels don't always reflect that you are making more estrogen. Um, estrogen, you know, our body doesn't like to make tons more estrogen. We don't really make too much, mm. but we have a hard time getting rid of it a lot of times and how we metabolize it changes. And so that can change how much our body's getting, but our ovaries are kind of doing what they can do. They don't tend to make too much. That's just, you know, they're efficient, but the big shift from having high levels down to like much more normal levels actually tells us a lot about your gut microbiome and you know seeing these levels having becoming much more in, in line says that the way you're also handling your estrogens even though there may be a little bit more in circulation the way you're handling them is more appropriate you know urine is about 40 percent of estrogen metabolism mm -hmm. so that means most of it's going out in stool so if you have a lot of gut microbiome issues you're going to recirculate a lot of that estrogen and then start seeing it more in urine. And I think that's what this is really showing is you not only maybe becoming like a nest need for high estro estrogens um, because the tissues can make it and things like that, but actually just breaking down your estrogens, clearing them out in a much healthier way, which says a lot about your gut health actually. I feel like it's improved. It was pretty bad in October. Um, yeah. The worst I, I, I can imagine it being from my history. But yeah, yeah, this is the best estrogen picture I've had even since 2020 by the looks of it. Yeah, it is. I mean, even 2020, you actually were still using your um, gut microbiome was still probably really circulating a lot of that estrogens mm -hmm. at higher levels. Um, and that was still there. But now whatever you're doing, I think you're probably making big improvements on your gut health is my guess. Yep, indeed. Yeah. Yeah, which is really awesome. Awesome to see that. So I think that, you know, looks, looks tons, tons, tons better. And yeah. I would just say, keep working like with the higher estradiol, you know, some people say, oh, well, does that mean I'm making too much? It can mean that you're that you have a lot of inflammation because you're not on hormones, right? So we're not looking at that. Um, it can mean that you're like, you know, making more with inflammation. But like I said, keep going with the gut stuff because I see that make a big difference. You know, fiber and um, trying to get those that bile acids to go because that will also lower that estradiol too, along right. with all the other anti-inflammatory stuff. Yeah. What's the um, three? Yeah. What's the the low E three? E1, E2, what, what's the relevance of that? Because I see that's been low every single time. So the, uh, the, so your estrone 
isn't low. Is that what you're talking about? The estrogen? Yeah, it's, or it's bigger, just, just under estrog estriol. There's that. E ah, the ratio. The ratio. So, so the, this ratio of E3 to, compared to E1 and E2 looks at like how you break down your estrogens. And a little bit, there was this idea um historically about like the ratio of how you did that and like looking at cancer risks and a lot of the interpretations i would say a little bit even the 216 ratio that we also are going to report a lot of that is like trying to assess like breast cancer risk at a time where we couldn't measure any of the four hydroxy estrogens we couldn't measure any of the you know these other um breakthrough, like all these other metabolites, we just couldn't measure them. So, you know, a little bit, we don't have to, um, they're less useful now yeah, because we know they're not really the story. We were just trying to figure it out. So, mm -hmm. and yours is really consistent. Mm -hmm. Understanding 4-hydroxy to hydroxy, that's more yes. important than obviously seeing it methylated is even more important because you want yeah. it methylated. Yeah. And the looking at being able to measure for hydroxy is really the game changer. And that's a newer test to be able to get down to that. Some labs still can't um, measure some of the methylations of the fours. Um, but yes, that seems to be in the research now with cancer. Now that we can measure those, that seems to be really the story that we want to see. Yeah. So when we look at like your hydroxy you know, twos and fours, like look at the change in what yeah. you're doing with the two, like that's where we really see it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and in particular, the one that is fabulous to see when we look at these twos and fours is how much lower your four hydroxy estradiol has come yeah, down. Very happy about that. I was really yeah. happy about having elevated four hydroxy. <laughs> exactly. I know it makes us all nervous, but it is really common to see when estrogens go up and someone goes down the two and fours evenly to kind of see if they both go up they kind of both go up but yeah i mean you can see for you you're much more in balance between your twos and your fours just in general um which is which is great to see you know um and we can see if we look at those height two hydroxy levels like they've dropped by like over half um you know, which is yeah, being which well is, methylated by the looks of it, which is, yeah. Awesome. When we look at those two methoxies, like highly methylating, you have a, this is where COMT enzymes come in and you do that really well with yeah, your hydroxy estriols. Is, is, is fast. <laughs> so yeah. There's some yeah. perks to that for sure. <laughs> yeah. And you can see there is perks because the two methoxy estradiol is actually considered protective. Um, and it's basically the same. You know, we can see basically the same level there, um, which just shows how strongly, but that's actually considered protective. There's some really interesting research actually prescribing 2-methoxyestradiol, which goes up and down as far as availability, I know, in the U.S. for compounding, not really a commercial product at this point anywhere that I know of. Um, but we can see, like, great methylation of your 2s. That ratio is high for your 2-methoxyestrone. Um which is just saying like everything that goes down your two pathway is highly methylated, which means it's turned off. And that's really great. You still struggle to methylate your fours and that is likely it's better. So, which is good, you know? Um, but, but I would say that's really often a genetic COMT SNPs and it's that interactions with your COMT SNPs with you know, your hydroxy groups as to whether you can methylate the twos or methylate the fours, which is why you can't look at your twos and their methylation and assume you're going to do the same things with your fours. And you can see you're a perfect example of that. Like you don't methylate your fours as well. Yeah. So it's even more important that those four hydroxy estradiols are now in the normal range, which means they can't sneak down that side pathway and create more oxidative stress and DNA damage. That's really good to hear. Yeah, right? Yeah. It is really good to hear. Yeah, and it's really great to see. I love the fact that my bisphenol A always comes back as low. I'm really happy about that. I'm, I work so hard to avoid plastics. I, I obviously not 100% yeah. because you just can't avoid them 100%, but I'm so yeah, and, and there is unfortunately a whole alphabet now of bisphenol. So it's a little bit of a, 
you know, a false confidence um, <laughs> in that, in that there's unfortunately a lot of companies have replaced the bisphenol A with S and G and it, like it's actually become a lot bigger and some of those are worse than A. We don't see a ton of bisphenol A, but we still do. Interestingly, a lot of people in Australia who send us samples have a lot of bisphenol A, um, which I always think is interesting and concerning. But um, yeah, nope, you don't. You still do that really well, which is great. Um, you know, your progesterone, um, you know, breakdown and how you're doing things like all of that is just so much more balanced, so much more even, right? Yeah. Still kind of the same ratios, which is what we expect, you know, but, but really just a ton um, lower levels and, and more clearance, just much more clearance of all of these, not as inflammatory. Um, and, and I think that, you know, your body's not trying to compensate so much, which is great, you know? And then, you know, when we look at things like your androgens. Yeah. Just so, just so you're yeah. aware, um, yeah. I, I'm naturally always high in testosterone. I, I don't think I've yeah. ever had a blood test come back normal. I've never had a metabolite test come back normal and I have no symptoms. Um, I think I just get the benefits of it. So yeah. It means probably have good, strong bones and things like that. So I'm okay with that, that level being what it is. I mean, it, it was much higher, 19, and now it's yeah. back down to 10. 10 seems to be like a good range for me. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is to look at your DHT. That's what I really appreciate. Like, you know, testosterone production will go up and down. But what's also nice is like, look at where your DHT or 5-alpha DHT is yeah. and where it's been and how it's dropped. Because I see some people with normal testosterone who have really high DHT. And I have some people that are, you know, like you, you have higher testosterone, but actually you have really normal DHT. And that usually correlates really well with symptoms. Um, that DHT can happen at the tissue level, but it can also happen systemically. And, you know, that's where you get the acne, facial body hair, loss of scalp hair, those kind of things. So it's nice to see DHT kind of come back into the normal range for I'm you. Very happy about that because in January, yeah. I actually got that male pattern hair loss. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's gone now, it's back to being normal, but um, yeah, that, 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 that was the only expression of, of the, of the higher DHT. That I was getting, and it was definitely that DHT being elevated. Mm -hmm. um, I've never had issues with hair loss before, and it, it happened for about two, three months at the beginning of this year. So shortly after um, I did this test and, and had even more stress. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, and it's interesting because you were your testosterone was a little bit higher, but it wasn't hugely. But you know, inflammation can really drive that DHT up too. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I wonder if it was just how inflamed you were um, more than anything that like changed ovarian wise, you know, for you, you just had a lot of inflammation yep, that was. was happening there. Yeah. So I it's nice. It. And, and isn't it, um, I don't know. I always think it's, it's great. Like, look at how consistent it was from 2020, you know, back there. Um, you know, and seeing that those patterns being really, and this is, this is a test of pattern. So, you know, it's always kind of fun to see that too. Look at your cortisol. You know, I know it doesn't look like it's changed that much, but actually when you see the numbers next to each other, yeah. it's, it's, it is actually a bigger change oh, than yeah. like in the beginning. And, and yeah. it matches the fact that I'm feeling so much better. Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. no, it's great. I think, I think it shows, um, you know, it takes a while too. Um, you know, these cortisols were pretty high for your total levels. And those levels have, have dropped, which is, of course, like how much of all your cortisol you're making, your free levels are still kind mm -hmm. of challenged there. Um, but that that does take a little time, you know, and you're in for people, you know, when we look at the diurnals, like they end the time point. So that's your levels like throughout the night and throughout the morning. And, and I wonder, too, if some of that anxiety that you had was because you were making all this cortisol, but I have to think you were also making a ton of norepinephrine and epinephrine and, you know, your neurochemistry was also really hijacked as well. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I would love to have done a neurotransmitter test as well. Mm, that would have been really interesting, wouldn't it? I Don't do it right. again, though. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have the right kits, otherwise I would have. I, I, right. I, but I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm looking at those numbers, going, you know, the upper limit's thirty-three. It was at fifty-three. Oh yeah. Example, and it's now down to thirty-eight. That's yeah. That's a significant change. Yeah. Oh, it um, is. And thirty-eight, thirty-three, like yeah, high, high normal, but like much more reasonable. What? Total cortisone. Look, it's only one point over the range, right? Yeah. So and the total cortisone is also because I was. You know, we'll show the patterns in a minute. Um, they they haven't yeah. really changed that much at all. But when I see these numbers like this, I'm I'm actually, I'm so grateful that they're represented like this. So mm -hmm. I can I can actually see the improvement. Not just it's not just in my it's not just in my head. You know, the right. improvement isn't just in my head. It isn't. No. Really, but it's also I'm <laughs> feeling it. You know, and now I can yeah. see that it's 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 true, which is brilliant. I mean, yeah. yeah. And we're going to have like you're going to be experiencing like those total levels as well as the freeze right that both are kind of true for our bodies so yeah i mean this is a huge it, it really is like a huge drop and i think it was reflective not just of like your mood shifting but i think it's actually really more reflective of your body shifting and then your mood responding to that shift yeah no you know don't you like that's conversation yeah, it's brilliant. Okay, so yeah. let's do the cortisol. Yeah. yeah, the cortisol's still sad. You're a little bit of a work in progress. But, you know, you said this was only like the last month. And, you know, it's not uncommon for adrenal stuff to take three, four months before you're really going to see hugely the cortisol repair. You know, we're all works in progress. <laughs> you're going to be a little bit of a work in progress. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, I think there are some big things that are different. The biggest one I think that I appreciated looking at this is how your nighttime, your going to bed cortisol has changed. So we're seeing that on sort of the second page here. Um, and that's that level going into bed and it's dropped by half. And that high night cortisol is really significant because when you have high cortisol at night, it's almost more damaging than having high cortisol any other time of the day. And it's very common with adrenal issues that you see that sort of bump up at night. But you know, when you have that night cortisol, you're not healing as well. Your growth hormone isn't getting to do all the work that it's supposed to do. You know, you're not getting that like deep healing tissue healing during the night. That is what sleep's supposed to do. Not only you know, as well as getting like all the sleep architecture being off regulated as well. So to me, that was a pretty significant drop. Yeah, no, it was it was quite impressive to see. It's gone from 11.6. That's cr incredible down to yeah. a normal range, like a smack bang in the normal range. Exactly. And, and so there's some research that like looking at you know, that if we had only two points, and this obviously gives us four, it's giving us, you know, during the night and then that first rising and then whatever. But there's some research that if you only had two points of looking at cortisol, that looking at your morning cortisol, which in this test is your second cortisol reading, which is that 16.6, .6, and looking at that nighttime and that slope is actually considered really significant in the research for where people's adrenals are because that in help, you know, you need to drop to induce sleep. Um, but it's a much better sign of someone's adrenal health to have that drop than it is to be flat, even if that morning level, you know, still needs to climb. Um, and I think will, right? But uh, yeah, that's a big deal. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel better and I wanted to see the results improve. Yeah. Um, and seeing them like this, I can actually see the improvements. When I saw yeah. them on their own, I was like, oh, goodness, <laughs> <laughs> looks kind of the same. And then seeing right. them like this, I can I can actually see the numbers. Yeah, and my melatonin is looking pretty good as well. It Probably. is. It is. Yeah, we can see you still are dealing with the cortisone in the evening. That's that's going to take time, right? That's a little bit of time. But yeah, your melatonin level, you're making good levels during the night. And you had much better levels going into bed. Um, so pretty significant, I think, you know, and the creatinine is just high. That just shows you did a really good sample. Maybe too well. Drink more water. It's okay. You're dehydrating yourself a little bit more than you need to in the morning or during the night. But, uh, you know, we're going to adjust everything 
everything per gram creatinine. So you're good, right. you know? Yeah. So I, I thought you're on the way. I think it'll be really interesting to look at it six months from now. Keep yourself healthy <laughs> during that time. But, you know, it'd be really interesting to see because I think it's going to shift even more. I think the pattern of the twos and the fours be interesting. I bet it doesn't shift a whole lot more with your methylation. I think that's your genetics at play. Mm. But but I think that the overall production and how much is going down those four pathways, you've clearly made improvements with that, which, you know, in the research suggests a good thing. I mean, it's not ready for total prime time, but it's it's why we do this test to get a sense of that. Absolutely. And I mean, I want I want to be the best version of myself going into menopause, just, you know. Yeah. Especially yeah. understanding the fact that the adrenals have such a powerful impact on menopausal symptoms. And it is yeah. something that is looming on the horizon. I'm not going to escape it. I'm definitely heading rapidly in that. All going to go there, right? Where there's no escaping. Um, and I'm, yeah. you know, there's a part of me that's kind of looking forward to the process. You know, the, the more I read about um, the fact that it's, it's, it's a change that's natural and uh -huh. you embrace it and get more enjoy your wisdom i think is is what you should get from menopause um but yeah also trying to prevent the symptoms now because yeah. we're laying that foundation for for a healthy transition because i know the patients that i see who are having shocking symptoms all have a history of shocking adrenals um yeah. so well, there's, i mean they're supposed to take over right they're supposed to take over and you know, to be fair, you've got the benefit of high androgen. So that's good. That's going to be your estrogen. You know, if you didn't do hormone replacement, your androgens are what is their precursor to your estrogen. So you've got a nice reservoir. Um, but, you know, having the low cortisol, then, you know, you go shift to the menopause and all of a sudden your adrenals are supposed to take over and they're just like, you know, frankly, they're kind of like, dude, I, I can't even make cortisol. And now you want me to make more? Like, it's just not going to happen. You know, and I, I think that's why we see in general, I think that's why we see menopause being harder today than it was a generation or two ago. I agree. I agree. That's in the combination of, you know, the excess xenoestrogens that people are exposed oh, yeah. to and the receptors just getting, you know, that noise that the yeah. constant noise so they they suppress themselves and you know i've done a pretty good job of trying to avoid as many of those as well yeah. so yeah across my transition is going to be quite easy i can't tell from my mom because unfortunately she was on hormones pretty much uh -huh. the whole the whole my, her whole life um, oh, really? mm -hmm. so she never went through an actual menopause and mm -hmm. so i can't tell what what from her <laughs> i can't right? <laughs> and so there's a gen I mean, there is a genetics to it a little bit, you know. Yeah, I'm just but, gonna do what I know, naturally, yep. all the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so we're it here for everybody. Yes, yeah, these are just the graphs. I mean, these are just the snapshot that we can see. So you can see that high um, morning peak as you awake. Um, but you know, it's a little curved. But look, it's so much more normal there in your urinary free cortisol still your cortisone which says your body's still dealing with stuff but it you know frankly to see the urinary free cortisol that's what your brain is going to see and um you know that the cortisone is gonna is gonna shift in time i think it's just it's only a been a month really so you know and look your melatonin is showing beautifully yeah no that's yeah that's great i thank you so much for this this is um what's well, inspiring yeah. it's inspiring to see improvements in any patient including yourself as a patient um yeah. and i i really hope that my experiences and this this recording will help other doctors to to understand the benefits of doing this testing um you know mm -hmm. track the track the improvements it's yeah. easy to read um less less chance of of making mistakes you know it is what it is on the graph right you can't really yeah. change you can't interpret it any other way so right well and with such a growing like interest in in genetic testing and how our genetics also play in this it's it's also a way of testing your genetics in action exactly. you know we think okay you've got this genetics this is what you're going to do and it's amazing how some people are able to do better than you might think and some people are not and you know supplements cost money and people have to take them like we have to have some way to say like yes i know you feel like this is working but 
is it working? And things, you know, some things you can't, you can't see, right? Like, you know, is your dim working? I don't know. I mean, I've seen people take great amounts of dim and not shift that profile at all. That's crazy. I, Should they I, keep taking it? I mean, no, I would say no, like eat broccoli, but do other things, put your money somewhere else, you know, there's yeah. only so much in this world. Yeah. And I, but also like, I think what really makes me enjoy this taste the most is the fact that you're looking at two methoxy because you it's can't so take assumptions. You can't assume that it's because nice. the, the two is high, that the four is going to be high. So you need, yeah. to, you need to look at both and you need to see yeah. that the fours are being methylated. And you can't even look at the four hydroxy estrone and assume that the estradiol is going to be the same way. I have seen people who methylate the estradiols, but not the estrones, who methylate the estrones, but not the estradiols, who methylate the twos, but not the fours. And, um, you know, the profile that we worry the most about are the people who are, they have high levels of 4-hydroxy, but even normal levels of 4-hydroxy and have zero methylation. And we do see those people. And we know in those situations, even if they have normal levels of 4-hydroxy, it's all going to those quinones so if you're not measuring those you're gonna falsely say to someone like oh you're gonna be fine if we didn't look at your fours right and your methylation of fours we'd look at those twos and be like oh you're a great methylator you're fine no but i also see people who have normal levels of the four hydroxy but have really high levels of the four methoxy and my question with that is there's a lot more going down that pathway than you're aware of if you just look at that. And mm -hmm. are are they methylating at all? Or do we need to have a little caution with those people? Yeah, exactly. Nope. Yeah, it's important to look at all the markers and not make assumptions. Yep. Absolutely. Well, yeah. thanks yeah. for your time. You're um, so welcome. It's always, always fun to talk with you. Yeah, it's always good. And I can't wait to do another one on your transmitters. <laughs> so. Oh, I think that'll be really fun too for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. Anyway, I'm going to yeah. stop recording now. Sounds great. We'll talk to you later. <laughs>